Welcome to Adventures in Grace. This is Jim Hockaday. Looking forward to another video on experiencing the promise. We probably have a couple more, maybe three. And uh, this has turned out to be a really good series. Some comments that have come back have been really positive. Hey, we're going to start out tonight with a grace story. This is a wonderful story. I've read this a few times before just in my own reading because I really enjoyed it. And I thought you'd enjoyed it as well as we start out here tonight. So here's the story. Hi, Jim. After hearing you preach tonight and saying that when you hear grace stories, it's encouraging. And I thought I should write to you with a grace story and I'm long overdue. I would always want BJ to give, that's my rancher friend, grace stories on the radio show because it encouraged me to look for the same or something like it. Anyway, the other day I was driving with my five-year-old grandson with me in the back seat and I was asking Grace for green stoplights because we were in an area where there was one stoplight after another and every light that we came upon was green. My grandson must have been watching because he said to me, Granny, these stoplights sure must like you. They are all green. And I loved it, she said. Well, that's really awesome. I remember my story where something very, very similar happened with me. And you say, well, that's just a green stoplight. Well, remember, anytime you're connected with God, the very smallest of things is where you'll find that God is involved in your life. Remember, if the little foxes spoil the vine, Song of Solomon 2.15, then the little repairs or the little nuances, those things that maybe you thought were lucky or just coincidental, are a part of restoring the vine. And this is so important because even as Jesus said over John 15, 7 and 8, that if you abide in me and my words abide in you, those words <clears throat> actually means rhema. So if you abide in me and my rhema abides in you. In other words, what I'm saying to you is real to your heart and you stay connected to me personally. He then went on to say that you're going to actually bear much fruit. And whatever you ask, it shall be done of my Father. And this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. Verse 8. And so this is very important to the whole reason why we do Adventures in Grace. Number one, so that God can come out of the pages of your Bible and get into your life. Uh, people need to see on a regular basis that God is actually working in and for them. That they're not just quoting scriptures, they're not just reading about God, and they're not just praying uh, one-sided prayers to God, but they're actually experiencing God personally and up close and up front where, where your life is concerned. So many that get into what others would say would be bigger problems of life don't have many stories like this to go back on to remind yourself that this is no big deal because the same connection that God made in order to even cause green lights to happen that would seem kind of coincidental, like you were really lucky, a grandson five years old saying, Granny, these lights must really like you. They're all turning green. Even he could recognize it. The same way that you connect with God in something so simple like that is the same way a cancer dies. Now, the only reason why we seem to think that it's not, that it's on a, such a smaller scale, cancer is something to be greatly feared, is because that's how we perceive it to be. But that's not how God perceives it to be. God enjoys every little nuance of every single day that we allow him or recognize or acknowledge him to be real. And so we're coming back to a great passage of scripture, and I'm just going to read over here it, real quickly in uh, Hebrews and uh, chapter uh, 6, if you don't mind, that's where we're going to go first, Hebrews chapter 6, and uh, we're going to just look again at this passage where Abraham is being talked about. This is a great description here because we saw some things about Abraham that were pretty amazing and tremendous. And that's where we got some of these ideas here over there in the Passion Translation of Romans chapter 4 and verse 16 when it talked about that Abraham uh, experienced the promises of grace. 
And, and we're supposed to experience God on a regular basis. This ought not to be every now and then. This ought to be every single day. And of course, you're not always in a situation to experience something that you might think is grandiose and big. You might just be in an experience uh, just the presence of the Lord that's with you. But recognizing that it's there is so important to your growth and your development. So as I read this, I think this will be really good again because we're going to go further now. But it says over here in, in Hebrews chapter 6 and starting in verse 13 through 20, it said, For when God made a promise to Abraham because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless you and multiplying I will multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Which just shows you that mankind is smart enough to get into contracts so that there's no more disputes. So that everything is canceled out as far as someone not wanting to fulfill their particular part of the contract. And God is so much more determined than mankind. What is God determined to do? God is determined to end every single thought that you have about him not fulfilling his promise. God is determined to make sure that your prayers are answered. God is so determined to be able to work on your behalf, but he needs our cooperation. And this is one of the reasons why the covenant is so important. Because even when Abraham was asked to take his only son on a three-day journey and go up a mountain and make him become a burnt sacrifice, which means killing him first, and then second, lighting a fire to the wood and burning him, Abraham figured out, because he was the covenant son, that God would actually raise him up out of the ashes. And this is the bold kind of confidence that God wants in you as well. Knowing that if he is the God that has called you, he is the God that will equip you and that will grace you. If he is the one that gave you a body, he is the one that will take care of that body. No sickness, no disease, no crisis of life has one up on God because through Christ we have complete deliverance from them all. This is why Jesus bests every single other covenant. In other words, he, he does one up and much more than even the old covenant. In so much that Paul said over in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 that the things of Moses and the glory and the content of the old covenant was, was a ministration of death with an inferior amount of glory compared to the new covenant in Christ. And we are able to go from glory to go glory so as by the Spirit of the Lord. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Liberty. So see, all of this, you begin to put this into a package, and God wants you to be absolutely in a place of such great confidence and boldness. Well, the boldness doesn't have to come because of your personality. The boldness comes, if you will, because of his personality, because of what he has done for you. It emboldens you. And if you want to know the prescription in the book of Acts, for miracles, it was always get filled with the Holy Ghost. Through the infilling of the Holy Ghost, there's great boldness. Through that boldness, there are great miracles. Amen. So let's just continue on here. Verse 17 is where we get hung up a little bit, only because, in a good way, because the words describing God are off the chart. It says, thus God. In other words, because men will get into a contract to end all disputes with a confirmation and with an oath, thus God. In other words, he's going to do you even better. And it says he's determined to show. Now I want you to get a hold of that because the eyes of the Lord roam to and fro throughout the whole earth seeking to find that kind of a heart that would trust him and believe him. It's a loyal heart. In other words, someone that adheres to what God has said he will do and will not budge and God will move on your behalf, praise the Lord, and he will show himself strong on your behalf. Now, what does it look like for God to show himself strong on your behalf? Well, that's probably what it looks like when you raise Jesus out of the dead, meaning that you raise the whole creation with Jesus, past, present, and future. Every, every bit of creation, humanity, I mean, died with Christ. And thank God we died with Christ. We also arose with Christ. 
It was because of our sin that Christ died. It was because of our justification that he was raised up. Romans 4.25. You see, that looks like God moving strong on your behalf. Raising someone from the dead when they were sick and diseased and died. That looks like God working strong on your behalf. Removing all that sickness and all that disease. That looks like God moving strong on your behalf. Removing glaucoma from the eyes. That looks like God moving strong on your behalf. In fact, for the one that's out there that hears this, we command that glaucoma to disintegrate and leave the eyeball. We spoke over an individual years ago that had glaucoma and almost like a contact lens popped out of her eye, which was the glaucoma, landed on the floor and she could see clearly. I'm telling you, God moves strong on the behalf of those who will trust him. But we're not trusting him with this made-up idea in the 21st century where we are thinking to ourselves, you know, if I can just have, you know, X, Y, and Z just in case God fails me, at least I'll have a backup plan. No, you trust God with your whole heart. And you realize through our covenant that we don't need anything else but what he has said to us. Now, it says, thus God, verse 17, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it in oath that by two immutable things in which it's impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. Now, I don't know if you feel like that verse is just too long to be able to take it all in in one reading. I do. It's kind of like reading an E.W. Kenyon book. You read one page and you just have to sit there for about 20 or 30 minutes and contemplate what you just read. Every phrase is meaty. Now look at what this says. God is determined. I mean, find someone in your life you know that if, they're in the, if you're in the way, they're going to run over you if you don't get out of the way. Find someone determined and then multiply it by infinity because when God gets determined, it's actually going to happen. And God is determined to show you something. And everything we're reading right now is to settle with all finality in your heart every question and thought that would arise to the contrary. God wants you to be bold. He's determined in what manner? To show you something. To show you what? More abundantly. Come on, for a moment, think about this. We're not talking with El Chipo. We're talking with El Shaddai. He's not the God that doesn't have very much. He's the God of more than enough. The God that has already made provision, already satisfied your need. Thank God he wants to show you more abundantly. When Jesus came in John 10, and we understand this is uh, right there, uh, one through five, we see Jesus is talking as the shepherd to his sheep that we know him, we see him, we hear him, we follow him. And then all of a sudden in verse 10, he said, I came to give you life and life more abundantly. There's that phrase again, more abundantly. What does that even mean, folks? Think for just a moment. If you had more than you needed, that would mean you had everything you needed plus extra. If you have more abundantly, abundance is already extra. So now you've got to multiply the extra and you've got extra upon extra upon extra upon extra. Even the psalmist said that he daily loads us with benefits. So if you haven't used last year's benefits... God's still backing up his dump truck into your yard in the very early morning and giving you a fresh load of benefits. He has too much. And the gospel is the too good to be true good news. I want you to think about this for a moment because these are the kind of things that we can stop, take a pause, and begin to meditate on. God is determined to show more abundantly. We're going to stop at that on this particular broadcast. Now, I'm going to have you to go over to uh, Genesis and chapter 15 for a moment because we want to look there and just see some things concerning Abraham that fit in this particular passage. 
It says in verse 1, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram. His name at this point wasn't Abraham because he hadn't cut covenant with God. His name was Abram. In a vision saying, do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. Well, those words right there are covenant words. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Then Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who shall come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars, if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. Now, what's happening right here? <clears throat> and we're going to say this quickly. Because we've already given you enough meat and potatoes for one meal. And we don't want to give you a whole nother meal right here. But I want you to see how this fits into what we've just been reading. Remember what we read in verse 16 of Hebrews chapter 6. How that men indeed swear by the greater and an oath for confirmation is an end of all dispute. Do you remember how we read that? Well, what's, what's that talking about? It's talking about two people needing to be agreed upon and having a contract or some type of a covenant set up in motion so that each party will absolutely, according to what is said, honor the covenant, giving each party great confidence and settling with finality any possible dispute. This is what we're talking about. All of a sudden, we come over to Genesis chapter 15, and what do we have here? Abram is questioning God. Now, interesting, isn't it interesting? We started this series on the promise being experienced. Isn't it interesting that when God looked at Abraham, this is after the covenant, and said, take now your son, your only son. See, those are covenant words. Take him now on a three-day journey up on a mountain and sacrifice him as a burnt offering before me. Now, did Abraham question God at that moment? And the answer is, we've already alluded to this in earlier broadcasts, we were kind of dumbfounded to say, isn't it interesting that Abraham never even said a word? He just woke up the next day and it says he woke up. I want to say that again because that just came to me as I said it. It said he woke up the next day, saddled the donkey, got the wood, got his servants together and he and the boy set out on a journey. He woke up. You say, well, what are you saying that for? Could you have slept all night long knowing you're going to have to sacrifice your only son? Come on, what's giving him such peace of mind? How can he sleep through the night knowing what he's getting ready to do? And how can he do it without belly aching to God and saying, well, what in the world are you asking me to do? Why on earth would you tell me to take my only son when this is the problem? Oh, it's the promised son. It's the promised son. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. And see, the wheels started turning. He started figuring it out, it said over in Hebrews chapter 11. In a figurative sense, he already received Isaac back from the dead. In other words, he figured it out. This is a covenant son. He will be the father, or I am the father of many nations that will come through this son. Not my other son, but this son. This is the heir of promise. If God asks me to kill him, put a knife in him, and burn him up, then God will have to put him back together through the ashes, and I'll be there to watch the whole thing because he has to honor his word. He cannot break his promise. What we see here in Genesis 15 is Abram, before he got this revelation, and he is asking God, he is questioning the Lord. This sounds like a lot of us today, and we've got an even better covenant than Abram with Jesus Christ, who came back from the grave, praise the Lord, and then through just simply receiving his precious work, he jumped inside of our spiritual being through the power of the Holy Ghost, and he lives within us, and the great mystery of the church is Christ is now in you. I mean, the keeper of the covenant and the distributor of the gifts is inside of you, the hope of glory. You can use this glory now. Put it on that sickness. Put it on that disease. Put it on that car that won't work. Put it on those children in the morning and send them off in the glory and in the promise and walk in God's power. Well, this has been a really good 
time, and we're coming right back here to Genesis 15 to see what happened with Abram and how he turned into Abraham, the father of faith. Thanks for being with us again on Adventures in Grace. For sure, go to jhmi at jimhockaday.com and send us your grace stories so that we can read them on this broadcast. We'll see you next time. Bless you guys.